Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and in this lecture, we're going to cover diabetes type 2, and we're going to cover this for the Advanced Pharmacology Nurse Practitioner course. However, we are only going to cover diabetes type 2. We'll do a separate lecture on diabetes type 1. So let's go through some basic information that we can get into before we even talk about the medications. And some of this stuff is fair game for your advanced pharmacology courses. So beginning with diagnostics, how do we diagnose a patient with type 2 diabetes? We can do that with a hemoglobin A1C. And the number there we're usually looking for is greater than 6.5. Some places say greater than 7. <clears throat> we're looking for a fasting blood glucose. Again, usually above 126 is what we consider the cutoff. And then an oral glucose tolerance test, the most common place you see this is when we test for gestational diabetes around the 20 to 24 mark of pregnancy. And the number we're looking for there is greater than 200. Also, when you're working up a patient for suspect, suspected by diabetes, make sure you get a thorough HPI, ask them about any signs and symptoms, polyuria, fatigue, things like that. We're also gonna order labs. We can get a lipid panel. We're gonna get LFDs um, the, to check the liver. We're gonna check the thyroid and we're gonna check a urine albumin level. <laughs> The first part of treatment is to educate the patient. You need to educate them about this disease. You need to educate them about a little bit about the pathophysiology. You don't need to go too deep, but they do need to understand the basics. What I recommend is teaching them that they need to understand that a high level of sugar in their blood is a problem. How does the body fix that? The body moves your sugar into your cells. The problem in type 2 diabetes is two words, insulin resistance. The cells are resistant to that insulin and sugar coming into the cells. Therefore, the sugar is staying in the blood. How does the patient fix that? We have a few different ways. We can lower the amount of sugar that we're eating. We can cause the pancreas to put out more insulin. We can block the body from producing more glucose through glucagon, or we can exercise. If we exercise, we burn up that sugar, so then the cells are happy to let that sugar in. Again, type 2 diabetes is a problem of insulin resistance put it at the patient terms that they understand that they have to be our partners in this. Next, as an APRN, you're gonna be providing referrals for these patients. A referral in this case could be a nutritionist, a dietitian, an endocrinologist. Keep in mind, diabetes is still covered within primary care up to a certain point, but it's always okay also to refer them to an endocrinologist. When a patient is being treated for diabetes, especially type two, which is what we'll talk about in this lecture, we are always going to be monitoring their A1C. So while we're um, getting them to their target, we're gonna be checking an A1C every 90 days, generally according to most guidelines. And once we have them at their target, then we go out and we start checking it usually every six months. Any patient that is diagnosed with type two diabetes, they do need to have a routine eye exam or a and or a referral to an ophthalmologist. They also need a routine foot exam every single visit. And again, we're looking there for the sequelae of diabetic neuropathy. Also monitor for cardiac risk. Again, diabetes is a comor comorbidity factor in so many different diseases, especially as it relates to the heart. So we have to keep a close eye on that as their provider. We do need to spend a significant amount of time just because we're doing a referral to a dietitian or a nutritionist, we still need to educate the patient on therapeutic lifestyle changes known as TLCs. They need to start these right away. You need to work with the patient to come up with specific workable plans. If they work in a second floor building, tell them you're done with the elevator from now on it's stairs. Look for little changes that they can make. If they're drinking a bottle of soda a day, get it down to a diet soda. All these little things that you can do, you have to work with them to make these changes. Don't just tell them you have to lose weight or you have to start diet and exercising. Give them specific goals. You're going to be seeing them on a regular basis, whether you're in primary care or pretty much any other setting where you're managing type 2 diabetes, you do need to make sure that you're giving these patients workable goals and keep evaluating them. Just like you know in research how to do that, how to set SMART goals, how to do this, you have to do the same thing with your patients. Remember that the diet and exercise must be done regardless of whether or not you're treating them pharmacologically. Unfortunately, if a patient has a high A1C, 12, 13, et cetera, there's no amount of medication that's going to get them down if they don't help us with diet and exercise. Honestly, even a lower A1C, if they're counteracting our meds with their diet, poor diet and, poor, and no exercise, there's only so much we could do. Also, consider the patient's motivation level in your decision, because very often when they're first diagnosed with diabetes, you and the patient are going to have to make a decision. Do we want to try therapeutic lifestyle changes for 90 or 120 or days or maybe even six months? Or do we want to go straight to medication? And that comes in a lot into the patient's determination of what they can honestly say they're able to change and your assessment of the patient's motivation factor about whether or not you think they'll be successful. 
Let's start with the first line oral medication, and that is metformin. In the United States, this is uni universally considered the first line medication for type 2 diabetes. Again, this is definitely a refresher for nursing school because you would have covered this very well. The drug class here is biguanide. The brand name is glucophage, and we use this medication like crazy. How does this medication work? Remember, we said there's a few different things we could do to fix the uh, sugar level in a patient with type 2 diabetes. We can get more insulin on board. We can get the body to produce less sugar, which is through glucagon. We can get the patient to stop eating as much sugar, and we can get the patient to burn off more sugar. This addresses two of them. This addresses the getting the body to stop producing more sugar through the breakdown of glucagon in the liver. So it blocks glucose production in the liver. And the second thing it does is it directly affects the cells. And this is one of the few medications that does this, and it's why it's first line. Remember we said in uh, type two diabetes, the problem of insulin resistance. This medication works by directly reducing that insulin resistance, or another way to say the exact same thing, by increasing insulin sensitivity. It makes the cells more receptive to that sugar and insulin coming into the cell, thereby getting out of the bloodstream, thereby lowering your blood sugar level. Again, metformin is the gold standard medication to do that. We use this medication for diabetes and gestational diabetes. So yes, it is safe to take in pregnancy. We also use this off-label to treat patients that have PCOS. This medication is also more, uh, more recently being used to address the metabolic effects of second-gen antipsychotics. If you've already taken your psych mental health um, pharmacology portion, you already know that the second-gen antipsychotics, the newer drugs like Seroquel and Olanzapine, those medications are going to actually cause or contribute to their known risk factor for causing metabolic syndrome. We just found that out in the last few years as of right now we're uh, recording this in the end of 2024. However, these medications can be the effects, the metabolic effects and the increased risk of diabetes can be counteracted with metformin. Again, that's still relatively new in terms of this being in the guidelines. The side effects of metformin, there's one very infamous side effect that is diarrhea. A large percentage of patients, when you first put them on, the, on metformin, they are going to develop diarrhea, really severe GI effects. However, there's a few tricks that we have. Number one, the medication should always be taken with meals. Number two, you have to start them on a low dose and very slowly, maybe, and follow the guidelines, but roughly maybe once a week, you can increase the dose or two weeks. We do it very slowly because they're going to be on this for months or years the rest of their life. Let's not screw it up by trying to rush up the dose too high and them having bad effects and them saying, screw it, I'm done with this drug. Also, the extended release has been shown, the extended release version has been shown to have fewer issues with the bad diarrhea. That being said, most important, educate the patient, explain to them that this is gonna happen, explain to them that this almost always resolves within a few weeks. So as long as they're prepared, you're using these tricks to minimize the effects, usually it goes well. Um, what else, the other effects of this drug, we have lactic acidosis and we have that it cause a B12 deficiency. Remember for advanced pharmacology, for testing purposes, a B12 deficiency is an effect of metformin. So we could ask you on a test, anything to do with any of the actual effects of a B12 deficiency, and you would have to be able to tie that back to being metformin issue. In a patient that's taking metformin, you do need to monitor their liver and kidneys pretty regularly to see if there's any issues there, and if yes, address them accordingly. Also, educate patients that on metformin, alcohol should be avoided. Obviously, I'm not going to say it officially, but one drink is probably not a big deal, but if a patient's going to go and get um, to a high blood alcohol level with metformin in their system, that could definitely cause um, pretty significant issues. Next, we have our GLP-1 agonists. In the United States, this is, according to most guidelines, the preferred second choice treatment. However, this is very expensive. Almost all insurance companies require that the patient already have been on metformin and is not yet reaching their goal or documented as being unable to tolerate metformin um, and not being able to reach their goal with diet and exercise. The drugs we're talking about here, I'm gonna highlight one of them, semaglutide, like Ozempic, which has gotten very famous over the last few years. Um, other options we have are Victoza, Trulicity. Uh, those are the brand names, the generic names would be liraglutide, uh, dulaglutide, et cetera. So how do these medications work? They increase the effects of incretin and incretin stimulates the release of insulin. So what's the net result of this? Part one of this, the net result is a higher level of insulin so that every sugar molecule has a partner to go into the cell with. Now, if that's not all it does, it also slows gastric emptying, which lowers a patient's overall weight by reducing appetite. And third, um, it blocks the release of glucagon. So it takes three different approaches. It helps the patient lose weight. It helps the patient reduce, uh, or I'm sorry, increase the amount of insulin that they are putting out, and it helps the body 
block the release of glucagon, which turns into sugar in the blood. Like I said, this is uh, the almost universally considered second line agent for anyone with type two diabetes that's not getting to the goal with metformin. That being said, insulin is also very often used as a second line agent in addition to metformin to get a patient to the goal. Usually that would be a basal insulin. And we're gonna talk much more about insulin in the next video where we make on type one diabetes. Some of these GLP-1 agates are also officially approved as a weight loss medication. These medications do have a black box warning that they can call, cause thyroid C-cell cancer risk. Not much there that you have to know, just know that. Side effects and adverse effects, again, these can cause GI effects nowhere near the level of metformin, but it is patient by patient. It's also much lower incidence of it, but the patients that develop it can um, at times develop them pretty severe. This does have to be, uh, you do need to monitor a patient for the, the development of pancreatitis. There's an association between this medication and pancreatitis. Um, and again, you'd monitor that with the specific labs that we use amylase and lipase. Next, this medication is typically given by injection. So you're gonna to have to educate the patient how to give injections, proper um, sterilization, proper injection technique, make sure they understand how to use it. If it's a multi-dose pen, if it's a single dose, all of these different factors, it's your responsibility to make sure the patient is well-educated. Next, we have the SGLT2 inhibitors. And these are also relatively commonly used. Um, some guidelines even have this as a second choice option. So what are we talking about here? The brand names, you probably have heard them, Farsiga, Jardians, Invulcana. Um, on your test, you're not going to see those. You're going to see Dabiclozin and some of these other drugs. So how do these work? These work different than all of the other diabetes medications. These work by getting the kidneys to pee out more urine, by getting the kidneys to pee out more urine. It blocks the body from reabsorbing that sugar, getting it in the nephron so that it stays in the nephron so that it continues out to the bladder, out to the urine thereby getting rid of your of extra sugar. This medication doesn't work as well with patients that aren't putting out as much urine. So if they have a low GFR, this may not work very well. However, this can be used in patients with renal failure for specific reasons that are beyond the scope of this video. This medication is interesting also in the actual guidelines for the treatment of heart failure. It's one of the four drug classes that we give for heart failure in addition to beta blockers and uh, ARB and um, the other medication that we give that I'm blanking out at the moment, but this is actually right in the guidelines as well. Now, when we are giving this medication for heart failure, we have to know to educate the patient on how it works for heart failure, which is different than how it works for the um, diabetes. And I'm not going to get into that in this lecture. Next, we do have um, the, the fact that these are contraindicated in pregnancy and in dialysis patients. Obviously, if they're not producing any urine, this is worthless. Plus, this is contraindicated pregnancy. Again, if you see signs contraindicated pregnancy, make sure you're assessing for that prior to prescribing this. This medication also has the side effect of weight loss for a completely different mechanism of action, but it does also have the side effect of weight loss. So if a patient is struggling with weight loss and they're maxed on a metformin and they're still not at their goal, this is definitely a viable option along with the GLP-1 agonist. Some guidelines, like I said, have the GLP-1s and this being considered equal second choices. However, most of them prefer the GLP-1 for one reason or another. The major issue that you need to be aware of with this medication is that in females, it is known to cause UTIs. It can also cause increased urination. Obviously, if it's getting more glucose into the urine and glucose is a larger molecule, so water follows it, we're going to have the patient peeing out a little bit more. Um, again, it can cause weight loss, which is generally speaking a good thing. This may not be recommended in a patient that has frequent UTIs for the aforementioned reason that it's known to cause UTIs. Also, because this does mess with the patient's diuresis, you do need to keep a careful eye on their kidneys, their fluids, their electrolytes, and make sure you're really watching their labs. This medication is documented to have a risk of incre uh, increased risk of lower limb amputation, as well as diabetic ketoacidosis. Lower limb amputation, I assume you already remember this from your uh, actual school lectures, that the number one cause of lower limb amputations in the United States is diabetes. So this is something we're really gonna watch for in our patients that we're treating for diabetes. Next, we have the sulfonylureas. I don't have a whole lot to put on here about this. In the United States, this is pretty far down the list of where we would go ahead and use this. Um, generally speaking, we use this if the patient can't tolerate metformin or their metformin is not getting into their goal and they're unable to get a GLP-1 agonist or an SGLT2 or one or both of those is still not getting them to their goal. Sulfonylureas, so however, are widely used around the world as a first line agent in many, many countries. It is extremely cheap and inexpensive to obtain, so that's a big plus that it has. How does this one work? 
it stimulates insulin secretion. So again, it works by increasing that insulin level so that every single sugar has, not every, but there's more sugars that have a insulin matched up with it that can hopefully go into that cell as long as the cell is not too resistant. Um, this medication, however, constantly increases your insulin level as opposed to the pancreas, which is very good at increasing your insulin level when you have a high sugar level. This works around the clock, or at least as long as the medication is in your system at an active level. Therefore, this medication, unlike any of the ones we've talked about so far, is likely to cause a patient to have hypoglycemia. So you definitely need to educate a patient that this can cause hypoglycemia and that they need to um, carry snacks with them or just be educated about the signs or symptoms, educate family. Also, if they recognize in their loved one that sign or symptom of hypoglycemia, that they should recognize it and treat it as soon as possible. Uh, this medication also has an increased risk of being used in those with a decreased kidney function. When you see something like that, obviously at this point, you already know that that means that I need to keep an eye on their BUN and creatinine, not only when I, before I start treatment, but throughout treatment as well. Again, probably the most tested on thing with the sulfonylureas is going to be that it's an oral pill and the fact that this is one of the few that actually does cause hypoglycemia. There are other options that we have that I'm not gonna get into. It's just this video would go on forever. We have the DPP-4 inhibitors. We have the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. We have the meglitinides, which is another one that can cause hypoglycemia. And then of course we have insulin. Insulin, we will cover an entire, entirely separate video about type one diabetes. The rest of these, if you're uh, not familiar with these, go ahead and look them up again. I would imagine most advanced pharmacology courses will focus on the ones that we focused on in this video. I do have a few extra notes I wanna make sure you're aware of. You are gonna see in, ter in terms of pharmacology treatment of diabetes, the terms basal and prandial. Prandial means as relates to meal. So preprandial means before a meal, postprandial means after a meal. You're definitely gonna see the term basal um, and that refers more to insulin. And we'll get into that more in the insulin video or the type one diabetes video, which is basically the insulin video. And we're gonna learn that basal means where a patient gets an insulin injection and it's not for right now, it actually secretes the insulin slowly or releases the insulin slowly throughout the next 12 to 16 to 24 hours, depending on which brand you're using. You do need to recommend and or educate your patients about home glucose monitoring, depending when that's appropriate or not. Again, that's also more so for the patient with the type one diabetes, but there's absolutely a place for a patient with type two diabetes to be home monitoring their blood glucose level. Any patient that is being treated for type two diabetes, remember every time you see them in the office, you need to be checking the blood pressure. You need to be getting labs on a regular basis, including the cholesterol and all of those comorbid factors that go along with diabetes. Metabolic syndrome is something you should hopefully know about by now. We've talked about that in other lectures. Again, that does relate to the whole concept of type two diabetes, not so much the pharmacology aspect of it, but I just wanted to put that out here in case you're completely unfamiliar with this, take a minute, go ahead and Google or chat GPT it so that you understand what that is. Finally, keep in mind, most medications can lower an A1C by one to two points. This is not like we talked about with hyperlipidemia, where if a patient has a LDL that's twice the normal limit, I give them one dose of a torvastat or one prescription for a torvastatin at the maximum dose, and boom, the patient's all the way down to 100 for their LDL. With diabetes, we can't do that. If they're up there at an A1C of 11, 12, 13, even 10, there's no single medication that's going to get them down. It's going to take diet. It's going to take exercise. Odds are it's going to take multiple medications. Metformin and most of these drugs are known that they can lower the A1C from about one to two points. So it's really going to be an effort with the patient to make sure they're working on that diet and exercise. Here are the references for this lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know.